Thank you so much for coming out. It's quite cold out, isn't it? Um, I have a cold, so maybe I'm just feeling the cold more than the cold actually is cold. So is anybody, <laughs> does anybody else think it's cold or is it just because of my cold? It's cold, it's cold. Okay, great, great. Uh, I'm delighted to be speaking with you this evening in Science Gallery. I always love um, coming here to speak, but it's, it's particularly special because it's part of the uh, Dublin Bowie Festival, which is taking place all this week. And I believe many of you have come from that avenue. Hands up, people who've, who've come through the Bowie Festival stream. Okay, and, and, and people who've just come here because they are always coming to the Science Gallery. Okay, brilliant. I'm just trying to get an idea of, of where I'm at in terms of um, whether people like science or not, you know, uh, along the way, because I'm like a huge science nerd. Um, so I'm going to speak for about 40 minutes, uh, if that's okay. And if you fall asleep, that's fine. It's a nice warm room. And um, we'll take questions maybe um, if, if you have any um, afterwards. But I do, um, I do advise you to uh, get involved and attend some of the events happening during the Bowie Festival. It's, it's really good. And the reason why um, I was asked to speak tonight is that it's the 50th anniversary this year of, of Space Odyssey, which is Bowie, one of Bowie's albums. And of course, he was, um, he was a real Free thinker and uh, and very interested in culture, pop culture, and responded in different ways to um, science and particularly space with some of his you know we, we know all the songs and stuff that he created, but he was also very very interested in mixing uh, different disciplines and and all that. So um, we felt that um, I was invited to bring space uh, different space topics to the festival. I'm delighted to do that along with other um, people that I work with in the same field. So Astronomy Ireland are doing events and. Um, Black Rock Castle Observatory. Um, I'm doing an improv um, show on Saturday uh, with my Crack Pack comedy improv. And um, there's a screening of The Farthest on Sunday with the director and producer, Ema Reynolds and Claire Strong. And then there's a whole day in the Phoenix Park of different sort of space and, and science themed events that are, all, that are all connected to space in some way. So it's a really good few days. So check out their website, um, dublinbowiefestival.ie. Is that right, Christine? It's Christine and Barbara. You can harass them at the end. They're involved in the festival. So I, I'll get cracking. Um, if that's okay with you. Um, let me see if my thing works. Just two seconds now, just get cracking. There we go. So um, I wanted to speak to you tonight about um, about my journey in, into space. It's, it's by no means a straight line. So I just think that um, I probably need to explain that I'm not an astronaut, uh, nor do I ever want to be an astronaut because... Let me just see what's going on there. Oh, it's just coming up now. Wait. Uh, and no, it's fine. It's coming up. Power, energy source. This is all planned. This is all part of the multidisciplinary nature of life's good. Let's see what's happening. There we go. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, because I, I'm not an astronaut, nor do I ever want to be an astronaut, because I don't believe I have what it takes to be an astronaut. Um, I want to be somebody who goes to space as a normal, everyday, average person, just for the crack. But, but also to kind of... You know, it's it's really... I, I am an artist and, and a communicator, and, it's, and for me, I'm really interested in... in pushing boundaries and questions and questioning why not. Um, there's no point doing something if it's already been done. And, and um, I had attended the Space Studies program in, in 2015, this, um, this nine-week intensive program for graduates. And it kind of attracted a load of people from all over the world. And, and some of them were futurists, thinking about the future. And one particular wise man who's in his 80s is, um, was a man called Professor Jim Dater. And, and he said this, and I never forgot it. Any idea about the future that at first seems um, appears ridiculous is worth pursuing. And I've never forgotten it. And he said that that's usually the case when people initially go, don't be so stupid, that they're usually the, the things that eventually always happen, or they're the, they're the really good ideas that come about. So my life is basically uh, an experiment about that theory in it in essence. So um, this is my brag reel, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I am, you know, I actually had to meet somebody and talk about this for three months to go, what am I? And I am um, a combination of, I'm, I'm a talker, I'm a speaker, I'm a communicator. 
and I communicate in lots of different ways. I communicate um, in this way by giving lectures. Um, I also make kind of public events for families, um, also for, for children as well. I'm very interested in kind of translating science into, into different levels of um, depth and language. And um, I like to riff off it as well artistically. So all of those things are the elements of, of what I present to the world. And, and rooted in that really is an absolute passion for, for, for curiosity and um, an understanding that I was very lucky where I grew up in a house where curiosity was just sort of like given, like making the tea. And then as I kind of went out into the world, I realized that not everybody is so fortunate and it impacts their relationship, particularly with science and maths and technology. And I question that. And I think that um, whatever way my brain works, um, I really like humanizing science and I stepped away from a full-time career in academia about 15 years ago realizing that that's really not where my, my I'm put to best use and I'm better to communicate science and bring it to the disengaged. We always talk about in science communication, how do you engage the disengaged? And the disengaged to me are people who haven't had the, the privilege that I've had of, of spending you know, 14 years in, in uh, third level. Um, institutions with two degrees in engineering and a PhD in science. So I, I know I'm very lucky for that. So I'd like to use it, put it to good use, because I wasn't putting it to good use in a lab, believe me. Um, so um, I want to tell you my story, and I guess I have to start at the very beginning. And for me, it began in, in my house. As I said, I grew up in a house where um, you know science was everywhere, and we were encouraged to unplug plugs and take them apart and, and question. And this, the, the space um, theme was always there because um, I was born after um, this major event which had an impact on, on the world, if you ask me. And coincidentally, it's also the 50th anniversary of the moon landings when um, Apollo 11, part of the Apollo 11 program, or the Apollo program from NASA, managed to have uh, two people land on the moon uh, on July 21st, 1969. So this summer, watch, there will be lots of things happening to celebrate that across Ireland because we did actually have an input in that. And that came from Dad. Look at him. That's him in the, in the 70s when Bowie was booming. Uh, uh, that's dad with the sidebirds. I don't think I've ever seen him as cool since. That was at uh, one of the many family weddings. He's one of 15, mum is one of 12. I have many cousins. And this is dad now. He turns 80 this year. We're having a surprise birthday for him next weekend. Don't tell anybody. Um, his birthday is next week in mid-January. And uh, he's kind of, uh, he kind of figured out what life is all about, I think, is he's never stopped learning. He's a, he, he embraced lifelong learning. He still works. That's his little office there, that building to the left that you see. Um, he has his fish in there and he's a beekeeper. I do, uh, he's teaching me beekeeping. We're going into our third season now. And, uh, and he still works away. And um, his passion for science and technology and mum and dad's united will for us to get a third level education was a, was a major part of what inspired me as a child. So everything, we would have conversations about science and, and history, wasn't really into the history ones, but we'd have these conversations all the time. And, but the, the moment that really, kind of kicked off for me was when I saw this. And it, and it was taken in 1968, again, before I was born, but we had a load of encyclopedias in, in the house. And I remember seeing that picture for the first time and expla somebody explaining to me that that's taken from the moon. And I was like, wow, that's all of Earth. And uh, making um, a vow when I was eight that I was going to see that for myself before I died. And that's what I want to achieve before I die. And that's the thrust behind that thesis that I, I said when I started out. How do you make the impossible possible if you're not an astronaut? And that's really what it's all been about. And the interesting thing is, and what I find this with children all the time and when I talk to them is, you know, they always know who they are. Most of them know who they are and who they want to be from a very young age. But if you don't have a path, a very clear path, or a very clear degree course that matches what you want to do, you can kind of get, uh, you can kind of deviate. And to me, it seems that everybody else knew what they wanted to do except me. And so, like in, in school, all your friends going, yeah, I'm doing nursing, I'm doing medicine, I'm doing teaching. And I was like, I don't know what I want to do. And um, dad's an engineer, so I did engineering. But I knew there was always something missing. And uh, I grew up in a house with science, but also with, with music and storytelling. And so we were encouraged to be creative as well. And I knew it was one or the other, and I could never decide which. 
So it was always a bit of a, a mixed bag. And so when I realized that, the, that academia wasn't for me, I, I switched into, into the arts. And all this time, the only way that I had this still in my life was in my diaries. Whenever I'd have these kind of moments of crisis going, what am I supposed to do with my life? You know, what's your ideal job? It would always be astronaut or something space related. And then it, then it would disappear because I could never figure out how to get to there. And thankfully, through the arts, I was making my first show uh, combining um, science with the arts, and I was looking at these different outcomes of my life and all, all the potential things that I could have done. I was trying to figure out why am I this ridiculous mixed bag. And so w I made uh, a show making videos as if these different lives still existed, and I was on one path, but there was a 59 gazillion other paths happening, um, kind of playing and riffing off a theory of particle physics called string theory. And so I made a video of the girl who wanted to be a ballerina, the girl who uh, stayed working in academia, uh, the girl who was a mother, you know, a stay-at-home uh, mother, um, and the girl who wanted to be an astronaut. And I had, uh, what I did for the astronaut was I, I emailed the European Space Agency, ESA, and they very kindly sent me a, a boiler suit, which is like the official suit they wear when, they, you know, when they're in training or for any sort of photo opportunities when they're not in their spacesuits. That's all I had. So we, we, um, the show was called um, That's About the Size of It, and uh, we, started, we started videoing it, and uh, we videoed me in this uh, boiler suit, and what we did was we lined up a load of science fiction movies, that's all I could do, and I started watching them. So this was the, what we started with. Cool. That was the six million dollar man, and um, and so that was fine. And we kept we kept recording, but the more we were recording, something shifted in me, and the reality that I was in a spacesuit that I did not deserve to be in uh, started to weigh very heavy on my heart, and I got really upset. So we kept recording, and this is what I said. And I would feel in the suit. I feel. Um I feel more sad. It feels very real that I'm not an astronaut. So it, so it wasn't pithy. It wasn't something that I just said at parties, because up until then I thought it was like, you know, whenever you have those deep and meaningful conversations with a random stranger in a party at four o'clock in the morning and you kind of share what you wanted to be in life and you kind of go, yeah, I wanted to be an astronaut. It actually was in there. And I felt that I had sort of cheated on my life and I had failed. I'd failed myself and I'd failed that little eight-year-old who was like so enthusiastic and was so like supercharged about having this amazing life. And I have tons of energy and I'm always doing things and I'm always achieving. But what I realized was, was I was putting all this energy into the wrong place. And it never left me. And that was 2011. It never left me. And... Um, I didn't know, I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to start. I knew nobody in, in the space industry. And thankfully, Twitter had kind of started then. And I started following different people on, um, on, on, uh, on Twitter, like NASA and the European Space Agency. And I slowly started kind of reaching out further and further. And I got braver and braver. And um, just before the end of 2013, we brought that show to Blackrock Castle Observatory down in Cork. And I knew they were a place for space. I was blown away when I saw it. And, and I contacted them. I went in there and I said, um, I said, I, you know, I actually genuinely want to see what happens. Uh, I want this to be my next show about what happens if I, as a life experiment, as a live art performance piece, announce to the world that I want to go to space. But what would happen? And they were like, brilliant. You're going to be our artist in residence. Let's make this happen. And we went to Science Foundation Ireland, and um, they have a kind of a small outreach budget, and they gave us money to make this show. And my next show was To Space, about what happens when you dare to dream the impossible? What happens when you activate a childhood memory? Why can't we do that? And so I started challenging it. And I really wanted to see how, I really wanted to see was this real or was this something that would go away? And I actually genuinely thought it would go away. Like when I wanted to be a ballerina, I took dance lessons and Kush came and I was like, hmm. 
I'm happy with that. I don't actually want to be a ballerina anymore. And I thought that that would happen, but it, but it didn't. The more I started meeting people and going to the European Space Agency and having all these amazing conversations, the more I wanted to do it. And this show uh, premiered um, here, upstairs, um, in uh, Studio One, as part of the Fringe Festival in 2014. And um, it did very well, and people kept asking us to tour it um, all around the world. So we got funding from Culture Ireland, and we kept doing it. And the first time we did the show up there, it was actually a very sad show. It was about an impossible dream. And you know, we had the space suit, that, that same boiler suit, and it was like, just put it away. You can have your dreams, but they'll be yours, and they'll never come to fruition. That was basically it. But of course, that didn't happen. And in 2015, I was invited to attend this space studies program, the thing I told you about at the very start. And everything changed after that. I was in a room with, with 120 people who all wanted to be a part of space. And, and what I started realizing was, was that if you take yourself out of your comfort zone, you start to see things very differently. And things that you think are impossible suddenly start to become possible. And, it's, and I started to kind of um, perceive everything that way, even, even the way I perceived myself I on Earth, uh, in terms of trying to find a way of, of explaining you know, the history of, of um, our place in space in itself. And um, the story kept... Uh, changing. So at the end of the time, when I brought it to the Adelaide Fringe, by that stage I had been on the Space Studies program and I had been invited to speak at different festivals. And out of being part of that, um, uh, out of out of to space, I continued my research and got another um, got another award from Science Foundation Ireland to make another show, and this time about the Astronaut Centre. Because I, the more I started researching space, the more I sort of became more interested in the people behind the people rather than just the astronaut itself. When I was on the Space Studies program, I, I met um, a lot of astronauts and they are incredibly brave um, people. And they are kind of like military people in that they know that they are the custodians for everybody else's work. So they never think of the, um, the discomfort that they're in or the turmoil or the, the, the sacrifice that they make because they realize it's a huge privilege to be there and it's their job to conduct the experiments. And if they're going up on the International Space Station for six months, then that's their job. So it was actually, they weren't the people that I could really connect with because um, they were doing what everybody wanted uh, to do, so they realized that, and for them it was about everybody else. And so they don't really, they, they, they have, they've been trained, um, whatever their backgrounds are, they're trained in such a way that they, that they don't think about how things feel in their body or how scary it is or anything. They're just there to do their job, and that's what makes them so incredible. That's why I will never be an astronaut. Um, and so the, the people behind the people uh, became very interesting to me, and that became the next show, Diary of a Martian Beekeeper. All the people that it takes to put one person in space, it was kind of like an iceberg, where you had the astronaut at the top, and very much like performance, a lot of people, when they go to see a play or they see a movie, they see the actor, but sometimes they forget all the different layers of time and energy that it takes to get to that point of presentation. And, and I saw that it was the same way with astronauts. And I also saw that it was the same way in beekeeping, and uh, that if everybody works together towards one shared goal, there is always success. So movies win Oscars when everybody is passionate about a project, and it's so incredibly difficult to win an Oscar. Um, we make amazing things happen as human beings when we all work together, and that's how we got a man on the moon. There was this super passionate group of people in their mid to late 20s, all working at NASA at the same time, who had this united will, and that were inspired and led on and supported financially by the government and by the president to make it happen, and made it happen. And I found that really interesting, and, and, and so I really wanted to tell the story of the unsung hero, the, the one person that it takes to make up this group collective, because they will, their story will never be told, but without them, without the one guy making the, you know, the seal for the, for the glove of the spacesuit, this person could die, that astronaut could die. So it's about this united will bringing people together. And interestingly enough, around the same time, the previous year, in, in January 2017, out of the Space Studies program in 2015, all the people that I met 
they were way ahead of me, a lot of them. Um, they were specialists in, in different aspects of, of space sciences. Some were astrobiologists, that's the biology of living systems off Earth, or geologists um, interested in rock formations on, on different planets and the geology of different planets. And uh, they were used to being in the field, taking samples all the time, much like archaeologists and geologists are all the time. And uh, they invited me to make an application with them to pretend uh, that we would live on Mars for a sustained period of time in order for them to take samples and to uh, take samples in the way that they would need to take samples if they were to ever go to Mars or to the Moon or beyond. And uh, one such facility uh, in the world that allows people to do that, to live as if they're on Mars, is at the Mars Desert Research Station in Utah in America. There's about eight to ten of these centers around the world, and they all have different specialisms. Some of them have extremely cold, extremely dry, um, some of them are underwater, some of them are on volcanoes, but they're all there for, for different reasons. And then space agencies have their own unique places as well to work on teams. The one that I went to in Utah is one that allows researchers from all over the world have access. So as long as you are conducting research and you're associated with some academic centre, you can apply to go to the Mars Desert Research Station as a crew or singly and then plonk them to a crew. So we went in as a crew because they realised from seeing the things that I was doing uh, on the Space Studies programme as this kind of artist and communicator that there was a huge value in humanising and presenting a new way of communicating this dense uh, area of, of research in order for us to prepare for the next generation of, of spacefaring humans or even the next wave of business that's coming, which um, they believe to be the space industry and new space um, particularly. So I was delighted. I mean, I am not a girl guide. You know, I am not an outdoorsy person. I love nature, but, you know, apart from camping uh, when I went across Australia, in really beautiful weather, I'm not an outdoorsy person. So I was terrified. I was also a good uh, 20 years older than all of the rest of the crew. But I said, yeah, I'm going to go out of my comfort zone. Uh, if I've learned anything since 2014 is, you know, um, by challenging myself and by being surrounded by people who know more than I do about a particular area, that's how I'm going to, that's how I'm going to step forward. So in January 2017, I headed off, just pulled the door behind me. Nobody gave a, a, a hoot in Ireland, um, and yet uh, some of my other crew members, um, this, is, this is the crew of us here, the crew of five, they had major press conferences, they were being, um, <laughs> they were being funded by different companies, um, they had all this publicity before they went and after they went, and I was like, I'm going now, and like Ireland was going, yeah, turn off the light, will you? You know, and uh, turn off the immersion as well when you're going upstairs. You know, that was sort of the sum total of, of what it, in Ireland, nobody really knew what, what I was doing. And I headed off, and uh, this is the crew, and we had a, a geologist, we had two astrobiologists, and an engineer. And we were there with a set um, maximum of, of experiments to conduct, and we had um, aspirations to achieve a, a certain level uh, on each of those experiments, which of course none of us, we didn't meet, because once you take the comforts of Earth away, everything gets extremely difficult and we take things for granted. So um, the experiment is this. So you go into a simulation or a sim and the premise of this particular, um, this particular facility is that when you start, you, you start with day zero and you call that sol zero because a day on Mars is slightly shorter than a day on Earth. So you can't call it a day, so you call them sols. Every time you go outside, you suit up it's not an actual spacesuit, but it's the intention of putting it on that makes you feel and realize what it's like to lose the sensation of touch and smell and being able to kind of move around mobility uh, because there is no oxygen on Mars. It's carbon dioxide. It's also very cold. The gravity on Mars is less that of Earth. You can't simulate that, obviously, because, well, you can't do that. But you can simulate uh, a rationed diet and a rationed water supply and rationed power and very, very, very limited Wi-Fi coverage that we would only use for conducting reports. And so that's the way we lived. That's the exterior of the of the actual um, of the actual um, habitat, which is where we lived. It looks like a kind of a grain silo. It was two stories high, and then that clear plastic building um, just to the right of it is the green hab. It's a greenhouse, but it's called a green habitat because it's off Earth. And that tunnel takes you to the science dome and also the observatory. And there were the only the, the tunnel was the only place that you could go outside without having to suit up because it would always take so long to go. And um, let me see, am I, can I get my videos to work? Let me just give me two seconds here. Um, <laughs> just gonna 
see if I can get them to work if I play them again. Yeah, that's that one. You've seen that one. So now this one. So this is uh, just an idea of the living circumstances. So upstairs is the living area. It looks very like an ordinary living place. You've got a proper kitchen and a uh, couch area. That's where we do all our recording and our um, all the reports. My God, we had so many reports to give every day. Your day would start at 7 a.m. You'd have this plan that you'd go want to go out on an EVA, extravehicular activity, which is to go outside. Something would always be broken because the facility is nearly 20 years old at this stage. That's my bedroom or stateroom. Imagine a broom cupboard or your immersion heater actually, uh, that's probably uh, similar to it in terms of temperature as well as lack of ventilation. I had a constant headache the whole time I was there. I think I was, uh, I was like uh, constantly dehydrated. And the interesting thing is then, you know, the first thing you do uh, if you were at home would be, you, you know, you glug like liters of water. You can't do that there because you've limited water. This is what we had to eat. Very salty supply of different freeze-dried foods. That's freeze-dried egg, there's freeze-dried broccoli, potato, butter. I don't know why there's freeze-dried butter. Uh, you name it, we freeze, it was freeze-dried. You just add water, yum, 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 not, not, not. It didn't matter. Thankfully, I have a terrible sense of taste. I couldn't care less. But it was amazing how the day would just go, you know, and as the, um, the artist there, I was, I was cataloging the whole thing, taking all sorts of footage. I had four GoPros on the way. That's a miniature camera with loads of different SD cards and I was uploading, downloading and we had to have a summary report at the end of every day. And on top of that, every time you go outside on an EVA, you have to suit up and you can't do this on your own. You need at least two people to help you and it takes, we timed it. It was one of the experiments that we did for, for Roy, who's from Israel. His, um, his high school asked him to do it. It would always take at least 30 minutes. It started at 45 and we got it down to 30 minutes. And then the second you'd put on the spacesuit, this would be, the, this would be the, the, the best kind of visibility that you would have. Um, the, the suit would fog up because it's an old facility and your backpack, which is to simulate oxygen, is a fan, but your half of them don't work. And I kind of liked that. I kind of embraced it because I went, this sort of makes it more challenging and more difficult and makes me realize how much you take for granted. So the more uncomfortable I was, the better it felt for me. The actual rucksack was incredibly heavy and it kind of chafed into my neck. The helmet did. And then I had a load of camera gear and your center of gravity would go. The second you'd go to, to sit down or to get down to pick something up, you'd have to go, Hoop, you know, to kind of pull yourself up. Also, the lads that I'm with, they're well used to field studies and they're always hopping up hills and everything. I'm not great with heights. I overcame my fear of heights by the end of this trip. So they're like clamoring up hills <laughs> and surfaces that look rocky are actually sandy. Oh my God, I was like, the closest thing to it is, um, has anyone been on a skiing holiday? For the, you know, the very first time you go skiing and you have the lifts and you have the sticks and you have the things and you have the pole lifts and you have to get off and everything. It's kind of like that, except, so you're, you're learning too much in one day. So your learning curve is like completely vertical. So you're learning by making mistakes. That's what it felt like every single day um, that I went out. But um, really, um, it was the camaraderie and it was the, the, the teamwork that sort of kept ah, everything yeah. together. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see the way I walk, how dangerous everything was because everything is heavy and you're wearing these heavy boots and these gloves that, that you completely take for granted just walking around um, the outside every day is, even when you're on slopes in, in this environment. And the one main thing that I learned from it was um, water, and, uh, and teamwork. We, we wouldn't have survived without teamwork. And in that kind of tin can environment, the slightest thing will, will send you over the edge. So if I was on a mission, I realized very quickly that you put the needs of your crew before you, and if you don't, it's not gonna work. And I realized that the Irish personality works really well. Our toilet blocked for the first five days we were there. And uh, some, of, uh, some, of the, some cultures are very kind of straight-laced and that was really embarrassing for them. I started cracking jokes straight away and it, it, dis, you know, it just gets rid of that tension and immediately you're talking about, you know, how did, <laughs> I won't go into it, it was pretty disgusting. But, you know, and by making a joke of it, it's, the problem was still there, but it meant we got talking about it and that was good. The most important thing I realized was water. We went to this um, diner uh, in, the, in Hanksville. So it takes two and a half days to get there. And the nearest town is this, it's not even a town, it's like, um, you know, it's, it's just one street and there's one diner. And uh, it's a pretty, pretty dodgy diner, but for us it was like palatial when you come out of there. And uh, we didn't shower the whole time we were there. 
and um, came out and I ordered, you know, um, pancakes and coffee. I couldn't believe I was eat, drinking decent coffee. Went to the loo. We were about to go off to Canyonlands, uh, which is a lovely national park nearby. And I said, I'm just going to go to the loo, lads, before I go. While we were in there to preserve water, you only flush for number two, not number one. It just becomes normal. It just becomes completely normal. I go to the loo and I was like getting out and I went, oh yeah, I better flush, you know, because anybody would go in and go, ew. And so I flushed and I actually thought that the cistern had broken. So much water came out of the cistern. I was like, <gasps> you know, because I had, I'd been used to this pump that was going, uh, 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 and it, but, it, but it flushed the toilet. And then I put my hands under the sink and it, again, it was like, it was ridiculous that like, it felt like 50 litres of water came out just to wash 10 fingers. And I went, that is the stupidest waste of water I've ever seen in my life. And it changed my whole perception of how I use water now. The other thing is, um, we all left and we, you know, I, I still miss them and I still find excuses to work with them because we, we formed a bond. I remember going into my apartment and going, oh my God, it's huge and being really embarrassed when I when I opened my um, my immersion press and I had like five duvet covers and about 20 towels and I went I don't need any of this I don't need any of it because I didn't miss anything when I was there I missed nothing I, came, I went in with two pairs of pants no I mean obviously I brought underwear two pairs of trousers and uh, about four tops and I didn't wash them when I was there and I was fine. So I'm trying to now live in a really minimalist, um, you know, a place and I'm still trying to find it because I don't need that kind of space. And I, and I wonder, do any of us, but we just need to be shown a way of doing. So it kind of kick-started a whole way of me seeing how we can live better on earth and it made me far more aware of the things we can learn if I were to go to space and experience it and come back, or anybody for that matter. And again, it was about perspectives and how you can change that. And, um, and so that, that has stayed with me and continues to stay with me. And I was hugely inspired by that mission to make my next theatre show, which was again about the unsung hero, but also about the cost of a dream and the fact that you can be doing something that seems insane to somebody else, but because you believe in it, it doesn't matter because that gives it merit. And there is a humility and a dignity in people who are, you know, doing that one thing of, of making a, you know, making the bearing on the one thing that, 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 you know, turns the glove that allows the astronaut to do it. And, and his story is just as valid as the astronaut story, if not more. And that's another reason why I don't want to be an astronaut because I think that their story is valid. So I, I mirrored beekeeping and going to space and, you know, being on that mission equivalent to being like one bee in a hive. And, one little bee's journey is just as important as anybody else's. And so I started kind of going, you know, nothing is impossible if you are determined enough and if there's enough people around you who believe and who want to support you. And so the, the performance art continues from impossible to possible along the way. And there's been other things that I've been doing to try and make that happen. I've been gathering a team of people from all over the world that are kind of on the same page as me and we're getting closer and closer to, to it. And some of the things are about having experiences before I actually get to space myself. And this is kind of the second part of what I want to talk to you about. This is the International Space Station. This is a, a space station that has been orbiting Earth for the last, um, well, since, since the end of 2000. So it's coming up to 19 years now at this stage. And, um, and since the very first crew came on board, which was Expedition 1, uh, it has been constantly manned. So at any one time, there's at least three people 300 kilometers above you that orbit Earth every 90 minutes. So they see a sunrise and a sunset every 90 minutes. And uh, a new crew goes up every three to six months, new crew of three. And it is the best, um, ex it's the best example of uh, United Nations that I, I've ever seen. It's run by five space agencies, Roscosmos, which is the Russian space agency, NASA, the American, uh, ESA, which is our space agency, the European Space Agency, uh, Canadian Space Agency, and the Japanese Space Agency, JAXA. And it is there as a test bed to understand the effects of the absence of gravity has on our body. They are in a constant state of free fall, even though where they are, they, they should really be experiencing 90% of the gravity we have. It's just the way they're moving. They feel as if they're constantly falling, and that's what makes them feel like they are uh, weightless. 
the effect it has on our bodies and also what we can learn uh, in terms of new manufacturing techniques. And so the astronauts that go up there are working non-stop. Uh, you know, they're doing a 12-hour shift and they're getting about two hours off a night and that's it. That's what they, that's what they get to do. And then put themselves through extremely um, extreme conditions to live there and also to launch and to return. So I wanted to start feeling what that was like so I can explain it back to people, to children, to families and events and also in, in my work as a sort of a theatre maker or a communicator. And um, again, everything that's happened to me so far has always been through the network of people and conversations. And I got an opportunity last summer to go on um, Roscosmos's, um, they have their, their astronaut training centre is the, is the Cosmo training centre. And um, their, their plane, uh, the Aleutian, runs zero gravity flights um, in regular intervals. And I was invited to join them on one of their um, training missions. It was cosmonauts training on it. And this is a plane that simulates the experience of being weightless just for 30 to 40 seconds at a time. You're still on Earth. You're just going in a plane. And it's the way the pilot maneuvers the plane that it makes you feel this way. So you go up at a kind of a 45 degree angle and you come down at a 45 degree angle. And on the turn, you experience weightlessness for about 30 to 40 seconds. You're basically falling. So it's kind of like being in a lift and it's falling for 30 to 40 seconds. And it's very confusing to the body, but incredibly uh, great fun. And so I was saying to myself, right, so I'm all talk, I say I want to go to space, but, but one of the most fundamental things is experiencing weightlessness. Do I have what it takes to even do that? I didn't know. I set up a GoPro and I just pressed record and let it go for the full um, two hours. And in that time we had 10 sets of th that manoeuvre. It's extremely difficult on your body because as you go up, you experience twice the force of gravity which is like uh, when you're on a turn on a roller coaster multiplied by 10, and it really makes you feel very ill. And then you go to weightless, and then it kicks in again on the way down. And it's called the vomit comet because a lot of people get sick on that. So let's have a look at how I got on. Oh, I might have to go out to come in again again, just two seconds. There we go. Yeah, there we go. getting cocky now. I think I know what I'm doing. You don't have to hold on to the bar, by the way. That's just something, I don't know why I did that. No idea. You'll see other people are doing far more interesting things than me, but I'm a total safety girl, you know. I have to know my parameters. Um, this was the worst one by far. It was terrifying, but brilliant at the same time. Terrifying. It's me in the blue beside the guy in the gray. And the guy in the gray, uh, he won his place. He's from Hungary and he's, he won a place on that for being the fittest Hungarian or something. And um, he started throwing up straight after this. This was our second maneuver. And so you're given a sick bag. Everyone's given a sick bag. And if you start getting sick, you're just, you're just pushed to the top. And everybody around me were falling like flies. All the people that were inexperienced like me were falling like flies. And I didn't get sick. I couldn't believe it. And it's because I'm a safety girl. It's because I stuck to my parameters. You know, so there's something to be said for it. And I let go completely when we were on the up and when we were on the down. If you move your head at all in that phase, you, you confuse your whole inner ear. And it's exactly the same as seasickness, I, I imagine. So you, because you can't see the horizon. I was exhausted after it. I was covered in bruises. I, f I just couldn't stop laughing because I think I got really excited excited that I was having this experience that I'd never had before and I loved it but I was terrified so it was very similar to the feeling that I had on on the Mars simulated mission as well and I was like going, I'm doing it you know and um, and, it, and it was brilliant and then um, in relation to that uh, I, I also started following the journey of this particular astronaut Alexander Gerst he's our ESA astronaut and he has just returned from a mission um, on the International Space Station he came down there in December so I wanted to kind of I wanted to capture his arc in a, in a way so that again so I could relate it as a story uh, in some way to people so um, he went up in June and again um, as luck would have it the, the people that I'm gathering around me made it possible for me to go and witness 
witness, witness his launch to the International Space Station, something I've never done before. I've never seen a live launch. We never went to NASA or the Space Center as kids, so I've never seen a live launch of anything. So this was my first live launch and a launch with people in it. And I went to Kazakhstan and to Baikonur Cosmodrome, which is kind of like the Kennedy Space Center of, of Russia. It's actually a Russian city in Kazakhstan, um, because when it was part of the former Soviet Republic, that's where it was. It's steeped in history. It's where Yuri Gagarin um, had his first launch, the first man into space launched from there, Yuri Gagarin, um, the first woman into space, um, Valentina Tereshkova. The first spacecraft, the Sputnik 1, uh, launched from there. So it's steeped in history, so it's a very special place. And I got to see the whole cycle, there's this whole tradition, this two-day tradition when astronauts um, launch from there. And our astronaut there is the third um, in from the left. And he went with uh, Serena Onion uh, Chancellor and uh, Sergei Prokofiev. And the three of them went up for Expedition 56. So this was there on the 56th expedition. And we got to go really close to the launch. In, in America, you can only go two or three miles to uh, as far to the launch. I was 800 meters, so that's like half a mile. And uh, the Russians are mental, but um, they really are. But, uh, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, is their kind of attitude. So they're much more blasé about safety. So I'd never seen the launch before, and, uh, and this was the launch. It was amazing. And excuse the bad videography, but I got so excited, I lost the run of myself. Um, no, I'm going to have to go in to go out. Sorry about this, guys. It's two seconds now. It kind of adds to the tension, though, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I forgot to video the rest of it. <laughs> I forgot to video there. I was so excited because everybody else was following it and I was like, <gasps> I got completely overwhelmed. Then I went, no, I'm just going to watch it. Forget the cameras. I'm going to watch it. And I watched it. And it's impossible. You, it's, it's, you've seen it so many times. You keep forgetting that there are three people in that. There are three people in that. There are three people in that. And it's incredible because it's so big and they're so very, very small. And I worked out the maths. It's equivalent to suddenly an ant deciding to get consciousness and going, I'm going to do a Formula One race and get in and drive a Formula One car around a track in Monte Carlo. That's equivalent to what it is that we're doing. And when you see images of rockets launching from space, it is as small as an ant, uh, you know, just taken off from, from the surface of, I don't know, um, a table or something. It's, it's mad. It is mad that we as a species have figured out how to leave this planet because we're so incredibly small in relation to Earth. And, and the frailty of it, and, and I watched it and I got, I got upset. I'll show you it at the very end because I was like, oh my gosh, um, the, the, the fact that we as a species, when we work together, can make something like that happen, really hit me the day I saw it. That, that we made rockets and we propelled something off this planet, we defied gravity, we defied atmosphere, we did everything to make it happen. So I, I was blown away by it and it took me about three months to really process that. And then the other thing that came into my head was, they're not here. Y you know what I mean? They're not, they weren't here, like, they aren't out because they're back, but they're not here. So it was kind of like they went into a different dimension. You know what I mean? It was, it was sort of like um, they became a character that we could only see on television or believe that they existed through emails and Twitters, but they were not physically here. And that's what we can do because most of the people we've ever known have existed on this planet. If you go back through history, there's only been 500 odd people that have left this planet from the word go. You know, like, uh, that just is, I mean, it just blows my mind. I'm sorry, it just blows my mind. So I had to see, I had to see him come back. I had to. I had to see him come back down, like, from whatever dimension he was in and plop right down. So um, last month in December, I'm so sorry to Astronomy Ireland, by the way, because I had to cancel a lecture. Is there anyone here from Astronomy Ireland? Yes, I'm so sorry that I didn't do that lecture. Um, uh, I, I really let you down, and I, and I do sincerely apologize, because the, there, there was a launch between my launch and, and, the, the, and the next launch um, that failed. And what happened was um, it kind of kicked all the schedule of, of land, landings and, and Alexander's landing off by two weeks. So my plan completely got waylaid. So anyway, on December 17th, did you have a good night? Was it good? Good, thank you very much. Uh, it was probably better without me anyway. Um, they, I went back to Kazakhstan and uh, they don't land in Baikonur. They land in... Uh, 
in Karaganda, or they were supposed to land in Karaganda. So the green dot is Karaganda, okay? Um, and this was where we, um, where most launches land, like 95% of launches land here. And uh, we flew into here, into Astana, and we drove down to Karaganda. And the plan was that we had vehicles and everything ready to go, and we had four-wheel drive trucks, uh, you know, with hot water and everything, uh, because when I landed in Astana, the temperatures were minus 10 or 11. Nothing. It was grand. I was having a ball. And once we got to Karaganda the next day, uh, temperatures started to drop, and things started to go a little bit squiffy. So this is the main landing site. This is a secondary one. This is the fourth one. Uh, very, very rarely they land in Baikonur. And this is what happens when the spacecraft has to have a ballistic re entry, which can sometimes happen if things go uh, a bit awry. So I landed in uh, Asna. I was perfectly happy. We were there the night before. I was good and smug making my videos, dying to have this experience. And off we went in the car. Um, the temperatures at this stage are kind of ramping down to kind of like minus 15, minus 20. You can hear all that lovely Russian been played um, in the background. And by the time we got to uh, Karaganda, which is the main landing site, it was down to minus 26. And I was like, sure, we'd be grand. Sure, they, they know what they're doing. And we had, um, we had a cosmonaut with us, Sergei, who was, uh, who was uh, you know, he, he, was, he, was, he, w he was the man that kind of made this happen for us, that was allowing us go to the actual landing site. No, um, rarely do the general public go to uh, landings off, um, um, off uh, the Soyuz spacecraft uh, in December because it is so incredibly cold. So what we were doing was really uh, maverick and, and uh, rarely, rarely done before. So Sergei went off to the meeting. That's the, he, has, he brought back a PowerPoint of the actual meeting. And at the meeting, they realized that the temperatures were getting so cold that they were going to have to change the landing site to, I think it's Jezikstan, which was um, 500 kilometers away. So he came back and he put this map up. I've never poured over a page so much. We poured over that for about 10 hours. So just to, just to clarify, so, so we're here. This is Karaganda. And this is Jezikstan, where everybody, so where the rescue team immediately just got in the car. Once the temperature started going down, they got in the car to Jezikstan. And this is actually the landing site in the middle of the steppe desert. And so we realized that uh, there were two ways in, this way from Jezikstan and this way, half kind of three quarters way along this road, you then go down to the step this way. There are no roads, there's no path in the step, it's just you have to follow people going in. So our plan was that we were going to meet the main team and go in and follow them in their tanks, because that's what you would need to get into the step. Uh, the amphibious vehicles, I mean, you know the ones, you know the Viking splash tours? You know the thing that they drive in, that. So. Um, we, we, we realized that we can't do that because uh, when Sergey came back, he said, well, they're here now. So if this road's impassable, they're going to go up and they're going to go down. So we said, right, well, what we can do is we can drive about 450 kilometers to here and wait all night and see what happens in the morning. But uh, we, we then got in touch. Um, we then, like, this is us just pouring over the plan and pouring over the plan and pouring over the plan. Uh, and about two o'clock in the morning, um, we would have had to la leave at midnight. At two o'clock in the morning, we just said, we can't do this because we would have had to, if, if it was Karagandi, we would have had to leave at eight o'clock. And for Jezikstan, we, we, we had to go at 8 p.m. at night. And we, we, we looked for helicopters, we looked for everything, and we realized we can't make this happen. And I was gutted, like absolutely gutted. Firstly, because I've, I, everything I do, I, I self-finance. And so every event I do, every, uh, every public event, every festival I do, I, I, I get a fee. And all of that goes to making these things happen. And I'd spent a fortune on this one. And I wasn't going to see the landing. And I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. But this is, this is space. This is what, everything is unpredictable. Uh, of course it is. And, um, and so I stayed up all night and... Uh, I don't know why, I just did. <laughs> because, you know, we were kind of in that sort of mood and we had a Baileys together and the next morning we sat around the table and we watched the landing on an iPhone in um, the hotel where we were staying. And um, I was just as glad that we did because we found out the next day that eight people died on the road that night with car accidents, just like residents from the area and uh, a bus and stuff stopped. And with temperatures, of, uh, they went down to minus 35 degrees. If the car stopped, if the battery went, um, if we ran out of fuel, there was no way we could um, 
there's no way we could have gotten back or forward. And to, to drive those 500 kilometers would have taken about eight hours. So we, we did the right thing, but it was it was gut it was gut wrenching. But I'll show you the video of the actual conditions, and you'll see how few few people are actually there. There was only one camera crew there. Um, they had two camera crews, the official Roscosmos one and a cameraman that, that went in with the European Space Agency and there was no public there whatsoever. So I think I have to go in to go out again for this, just two seconds. It's worth it though, because when you see this you go, ah yeah, no, you did the right thing, me, fair play to you. <laughs> Let me see. <laughs> so this is, um, this is Sergei coming out. And when you see how weak they are, and by the way, that took about 10 minutes to get them out. Like they, they, This is just a summary. So what happened was it landed, the, a bunch of about four or five people went, and they put this special kind of a structure with a ladder to get in. And they took a long time to get him out. And then it took even longer to get Serena out. And they gave her a tissue, because she was actually still throwing up when she came out. <laughs> she was in an awful state. Um, somebody actually had to physically go in. Normally they help them and they pull them out, but they actually had to physically go in. And you see, they get carried out. And this is because when you're in weightlessness for six months, you forget um, how much you weigh and your muscles start to atrophy and your bones, um, you know, the calcium comes out of your bones. And also you're extremely dizzy because your sense of where you are in 3D space is gone. So if they turn their head at all, it's like, woo, woo, woo. So you see them trying to keep their head very safe. And then Alexander Gerst, he's born for space. He came out and he just jumped out and there was no problem to him at all. And uh, so he, he did more weights, he did more training than he was asked to do and they reckon that that's a really good thing. He overtrained, and they reckon it's because he, his muscles were stronger that he, he dealt with it much better. But the only people that are there are people from NASA, people from ESA, and people from Roscosmos. And the interesting thing was that at the end, um, there's this press conference where they're given the Kazakh um, dress, and you'll see that Serena is missing, because Serena was still ill. That only ever happened once before, when So Yin Yi, a South Korean uh, astronaut who was selected from thousands of people from the general public, they had a ballistic drop, which, which was when it goes horribly wrong, and uh, she was very ill afterwards. So that's how sick poor Serena was after the, after the mission. I was gutted. I was absolutely gutted. But the really good thing that came out of it was I got more people involved in, in my big mission, and my big mission is starting to become concrete. And I'm at a stage now where I just need funding. I never thought that I'd actually ever be in a position to say that. So, so taking stock on that trip, what I learned was that failure is an option, and you always have to accept that it may not be your turn. And even when my mission to space happens, Something could happen that I not, may not be able to go, and my second, my second in line may, may have to go instead of me. But that's OK, because I'll have learned enough to be able to share what I, I have learned with people, and, and not to be selfish about it, because it is about, ultimately, it's about telling a story of space from an everyday human's point of view, and sharing what launch is like, sharing what training is like, sharing how difficult weightlessness is, and how trapped you feel in those small spaces. So if it's not me, my second in command is going to be able is going to be prepped to be able to tell that story just as capably as I can. And I look back on that picture and I'm not giving up. I will get to the moon one day. Um, all these things are coming down the line. And I want to share with you a, a video of a reflection that I had that I'm only kind of, uh, only kind of now um, allowing myself watch, which happened in June after the launch. I hope the video works again. And I just have one few thing, one or two little things to say. No, I'm going to have to get out to come in again. There, where's my mouse? There, she's there. Sorry, just two seconds now. Uh, just saw the launch. It was amazing. This is in June. Um, got me really upset. I'm not really sure why. <laughs> I think it's because uh, it's incredible to see, to think that there was three people up in that, and that um, it was so controlled, and it's such a feat of of uh, of um, ability to be able to do it, and also I want it to be me one day. I'm seeing it. I never thought I'd see a launch, I never thought I'd be in Baikonur, and here I am, so it sort of feels like I'm on this uh, 
uh, path and that um, it's I'm doing it like I'm actually doing it or yeah, you know, like you just don't know what the future is going to bring. If I had been told that in 2011 <coughs> in that spacesuit, uh, there's no way. I mean, it's only it's only seven years later, and I feel I've achieved so much already. And I really, I really do believe I'm going to do this. And and that's kind of hard to get your head around. But you, you but I have to accept that and just keep going forward and not give up. And if it stops, it stops. That's okay. I'm giving up the day I don't want to do this anymore, or I get there, and then the, the real job begins from then on. So I continue to work with the European Space Agency and Blackrock Castle Observatory, and NASA have now invited me. They invited me to speak at their Innovation Summit last November, so they're starting to understand what it is that I'm trying to do. I don't want to be an astronaut. I'll never be an astronaut. I want to be a human being experiencing these things to remind people how incredible we are when we work together. I mean, now we're talking about putting a permanent habitat on the moon and all the space agencies are working together to make that happen using state-of-the-art technology. And we need innovation, we need cross-disciplinary, we need people from different walks of life to get together. And there needs to be a human response to that as well, because we have to be careful. Technology, my oh God, I know it, because I love it. Technology is very beguiling, but you always have to think about the implications long-term to humanity. So the last thing i leave you with is how I had to get my head around who we, who we are and where we are in space. We are on this planet, you know, and, and one day I hope to look at it in its entirety, but we are part of something much, much bigger. And sometimes we forget that. And, you know, if you, if you think about it, it really can set you free sometimes and make you realize we're only here for such a short period of time. You know, let's, let's, let's make it count because we are part of a solar system, which we know about. You know, we've got our, our sister planets around us and we're orbiting our sun, which is considered to be a pretty insignificant star even though it still takes eight minutes for the light of the sun to reach us. And we are, you know, our, our neighbors are all other insignificant stars. Our nearest neighbor is Alpha Centauri, and that's 4.3 light years away. And all of that is part of the Milky Way galaxy. And uh, the Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years in diameter. It's a number that we can't even fathom. If we were to even try to get to Alpha Centauri, it would take us, it's impossible, it's impossible. It, it's already taken, you'll see from the Voyager mission how long it's taken to even get to, to Pluto and Neptune, the planets that are at the edge of our solar system. And our galaxy is grouped among another group of galaxies, and then they're gathered into superclusters, and then they're grouped into local superclusters, and there's 55 superclusters within the observable universe, the edge of which is 46.6 billion light years away from us here right now, and that's just what we know today. I imagine that when we launch the James Webb Telescope and more and more sophisticated telescopes, we'll have to change our perception of ourselves all the time. We always look at, at the world from our viewpoint as if we are the center of it. Our time, our, our relationship to time is that in terms of the universe, and yet for us it's 80, 90 years, it's a lifetime. To me, it has set me free seeing myself that way, and it has made me see what incredible things we can do when we work together, and the only way we have a future is if we work together, and we do need to go to space. For me, for us to reflect back on how important it is for us to uh, maintain the planet that we have, how beautiful it is, and for me to keep walking slowly but surely towards space. There's one little video I want to share with you uh, from people that I asked about what inspires them about the universe. And here it is, if it plays. Sorry about this, guys. They say it far more intelligently than I do. The size is just uh, mind-bogglingly enormous and I always think it's, uh, the numbers are, are just quite amazing. Uh, if, if you imagine you have something between 300 billion and 500 billion stars in a galaxy and 300 to 500 billion galaxies in the universe, these are quite mind-numbing. Seconds after the big bang. 
you may be just quarks and electrons, let's say. But it's the way you're put together, the way they are put together is so unbelievably unique. But compare yourself with the vast majority of the molecules or the quarks in the universe, which basically are doing bugger off. And you're unbelievably unique. It just seems crazy that there's, uh, that you have sentient beings on a planet, on a rather insignificant planet around an insignificant star in a unremarkable galaxy that we can ask questions, that we can ask questions about what's the most important thing in the universe. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a head record. I, I think e e if you were to look in the most objective way, your existence and your ability to to be that consciousness of the universe is so astonishingly unlikely. It's such a privileged thing to be in the universe. Thank you very much. Sure, if we have time for questions, but if you have any, um, is there anybody you can raise your hand? Anybody? No, yes, yes, sorry, yes, yeah. There's a microphone coming down, it's okay, it's fine. <laughs> Thank you. I just wondered uh, when you're wearing these suits, these yeah. helmets. Mm. Uh, that may sound like a stupid question, but how do you scratch your nose if you have an itch? That's it, and you do have a scratchy nose. You do have an itchy nose. You can't. Uh, Roy had this thing. It was hilarious. He had the, if you imagine, there was a sort of like a rim, like a kind of a, um, oh, what's those things under the window? Um, yeah. Sill, a window sill, like a window sill. He, like, it's like a little sill here, and he had like a, a tiny little paintbrush, and he was able to, uh, he was able to, to use the paintbrush to, to wipe the fog away off the helmet. Um, so people think of ingenious things, but no, and it's funny, uh, the first few times you wear it, you, you, your nose is immediately itchy because you, you know you can't, you can't scratch it. And then you go, oh, it doesn't matter. You just forget about it, you know? But yeah, you think of anything, you know, what you can do. Oh, well. You'd have to come in. I mean, it would depend on how uncomfortable it is. I mean, there's horror stories, you know, um, from the International Space Station. Two astronauts, uh, and I'm sure there's more. I, I know Chris Hadfield. I I, the other one escapes me, the name of the other one. But, um, you know, there's a whole cooling system in, your, uh, in, in their spacesuit um, when they're outside on an EVA on the, on the space station. So they're exposed to the temperatures of the sun, which are in excess of 150 degrees on one side, and then minus 100 or 150 degrees on the other side. And um, the water system had a leak, or or, or it was his drinking water or something, and, and it leaked into the helmet. And, and of course, water doesn't behave the same way it does uh, you know, with gravity. And um, he had cleaned his visor the night before, and uh, he had used a kind of one of those lens cleaners. So it, it got into his eye and it really stung him. And it started kind of going across, because it doesn't move. It started kind of, the, so the glob was in his eye and he couldn't get rid of it. And it started slowly going across his second eye and he was nearly blind and they, and they had to call him in. And another astronaut had happened to, he went completely blind and he had to be guided in just using the, the tethers and everything to get back in. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a problem. It is a problem. I didn't, believe me, it wasn't. I mean, I was like Cindy compared to that or, or a Barbie doll equivalent. There was nothing like that for me, but, but a really good question. But it really made me realize how extreme, even taking away those simple things, how it impacts your quality of life and how we take so much for granted. But space has become an absolute obsession of mine, how we waste space, you know, living space. Oh, yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, in a world where we're kind of so overly concerned at the moment about data and AI, and we're kind of reaching a point where everything we learn is becoming automated, like our understanding of space, the process itself will become automated at some point. Do you foresee that impacting what it is you do in terms of humanizing that story? 
I think um, it's a really good question. I think it makes it all the more important, actually. Um, because for me, the reason why I want to do it is that, again, it's to engage the disengaged. Uh, you know, um, you kind of take for, like, language is a very interesting thing. And, you know, uh, it's the same way, like, if you, you've you been rare to speak English and you're in a room with people speaking Russian, you can't get into that conversation. You can try, but, but you can't. And I feel it's the same way sometimes with science and space. And I think that we should be making decisions as, as a civilization and, uh, you know, and globally. But if, they, if, if people don't have that vocabulary, that scientific vocabulary, they can't get engaged in that conversation. So I feel if you humanize it, everybody knows what things feel like, you know, and, and that's, part, that's the most important thing of why I do what I do and why I want to go to space. Because if they see somebody that's relatable, that talks about it in an everyday way and, and is honest about the experience, it makes it more real and, and the stakes go up. So people are more invested in space and they understand the value of it and hopefully they understand understand how lucky we are to be on Earth. And the more automated that's getting, it's like what I said, we have to be very careful with technology. I love technology. I mean, God, I love automate. I love AI. I just love it. I just love the fact, you know, that my phone can do something that I can very easily do myself, you know, like, um, but um, there's a cost to that, you know, and, and uh, a, a, on a human level and the manufacture of it and everything. So the more people know, the better chance we have of making the right decision going forward. And I think that people have a right to know the information and make the decisions. But if they're not in the room and they don't understand the language, they don't have any hope. And so I think in order to have a civilization that I want to be a part of, I want everybody to be on the same page. So, yeah. Um, yes, yes, question up here. Run, Elise, run, 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 Elise, run. She's on the clock. She's doing the marathon. Hi. Um, with things like Martian Beekeeper and the, the permanent space station that you're talking about in the future, like for you personally, what is kind of the... Assuming that when you go to space, you wouldn't just be stopping over for like an overnighter. <laughs> but what would be kind of the amount of time that you would aim to spend in space or what would be even be the maximum like if you were given the opportunity but you had to stay for a minimum of two years like how would that kind of work for you that's okay that's okay that's fine so you know it's I'm breaking it into chunks I mean ultimately I do want to go to Mars but firstly let's get into Earth's orbit for a bit so I would imagine that a mission like that would be two weeks two weeks long then I would love to be a part of the moon village uh, on the moon. And that they are, you know, they'd probably be a month to two months. And, and then ultimately to go to Mars to come back. For me, it's about coming back. It's not about me having this experience and then selfishly then just going asleep and turning the light off. It's about making it tangible so that people appreciate what actually is happening and what actually is at stake and what are the consequences of these things that we're doing for us as a species, you, you know what I mean? And so, um, and all of that is about coming back to give a lecture, but also to make something that uh, will reach the most people uh, uh, as I can. You know, so so for me, I, I feel Ireland is great and, and England is great, but now I got to go global. So now I got to really kind of up the ante this year and really get out there and, and try and attract people from other parts of the world to get engaged in, in something like this in order for it to happen and to get more people to think like that, which is also a part of it. So yeah, so two years would be fine, I do it. I mean, that's what Diary of a Martian Beekeeper was about. It was about the toil and the struggle and the daily grind. But if you're passionate about something, I mean, there are millions of people all over the world doing it. I mean, most people, I believe, working in a lab, um, you know, who are publishing papers and doing the research and, the, and the, the type of work that I was doing, they should be applauded because they're heroes, because they're focusing on one tiny little thing but because it matters to them, they're contributing to one part of a much bigger whole that will ultimately lead to the understanding of something greater. Rarely does one person have a major you know, um, eureka moment. It's always built on the shoulders of, of other people. So if that's what I do, then I'm, I'm delighted to be that. I, it's, I don't want the glory. I want to have the experience to, to share it. That, that's the point, you know? So yeah. Um, yeah, over here. Go, Elise. Do you have your Fitbit on? <laughs> you should have.
Thank you so much, very interesting. Uh, do you know that there are uh, certain communities emerging like uh, who claims to be space nations? For example, Asgardia, yeah. uh, you may have heard about it. Yeah. So they offer uh, citizenships yeah. and they have their own constitution. What do you think about these kind of virtual communities who claim to be like? Yeah. I, I think they're fine, but I think the, the problem is, is that I'm in a bubble of people who love space. The people of Asgardia are in a bubble who love space, and that's brilliant and good luck to them. I'm interested in the people who don't know anything about this. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm as I said, the disengaged. There are, there are so many people that are passionate about it, and they're doing amazing things, and I applaud them, and I, you know, I, I think it's great what they're doing. But I'm really interested in the person who, who, who I meet on the street who thinks the moon landings were fake, and who, um, who, you know, who, who don't, you know, who, who just like they're curious, but they 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 think it's they think it's not their information to own. They're the people I'm really trying to attract. So I would love th those people to know about Asgardia and let them experience it. So um, I don't have any opinion of anybody who's already in space. I think it's great. I, I applaud and support anybody who who's who's trying to do something different or try, trying to do something new. But but I guess they're not they're not the people I'm trying to connect with. So I don't really have an opinion. Does that answer your question? Yeah, great. Um, yeah, one here, and then I think we better, and one there, and then we better stop. How do we, uh, um, Amanda, thank you. Yeah. Um, oh, is this a question? Is it quick? Is it very quick? Okay, no, this lady, there's a queue. There's a queue. There's a queue. Hi. Hi. Uh, you were saying that when you came back from your experience in Utah, you realized you didn't need as much stuff as yeah. you had. Like, so I'm just wondering about like your experience coming back into sort of a consumerist culture and like, did you get rid of a lot of stuff or was that difficult? I'm trying to get rid of stuff, but I can't. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's really interesting. Going through that at the moment, I uh, got rid of my car. That's the most, that's the major thing. Um, and uh, the go-car is great because, you know, like it was crazy during science week because I was like hiring go-cars. It was like, this is ridiculous. But I'd rather do that than have a car sitting outside uh, my front door unless it's like completely electric and I can't afford it. And you know, it's stupid, I don't need it. I'm on my own, I don't need it. Um, I gave away a lot of my books. I haven't bought any new clothes since I came back. This is second hand. Um, these are old boots. All the clothes I buy now, I go to consignment stores and they're beautiful, like really nice. Um, and I'm, I'm not like a, a crusty, you know what I mean? Like I'm not a hemp person or anything like that. Like I still do like live in the real world because I think you have to find, so I'm kind of searching for alternatives that aren't kind of hempy crusty because I don't think they're going to appeal to, to, to the mass audiences. So that's why I'm really interested in, in other ways of living particularly, you know, particularly with the housing crisis. So yes is the answer. I still have a load of books to give away and I have a load of clothes to give away, but I'm not gonna just throw them out. I have to, f I have to repurpose them, so I haven't figured that out yet. Okay, um, and then one, one up here, I think, and then we better stop. Hi, is that? Yeah, I was yeah. just wondering, do you have any apprehension about the privatization of space or the exploitation of minerals, uh, of the moon, or? I think the privatization of space is inevitable. I think it's like, uh, I, I think it's like the next wave of exploration. Um, now I'm no expert, just saying uh, this is just my own um, personal opinion. You know, I, I see it as like when, uh, you know, the Portuguese and the Spanish headed off in their ships in the 1500s and they claimed, uh, you know, all these countries as their own and they took what they wanted from it um, and then they discovered gold and then you had the carpet baggers. I think it's, it's um, I think financially the only way uh, we're going to achieve some of the some of the missions that will help humanity will have to be private, public, you know, so there will be an amalgamation of a space agency with a private organization. Uh, mining minerals ethically, we have so much work to do uh, in terms of law and um, ethics around it, and space law is becoming an emerging area that can't develop uh, quickly enough um, because it's a whole area that I think is very, very uh, hairy at the moment 
and nobody really knows who owns what. And even the treaties that are already in existence, th there's still, you know, there's the Outer Space Treaty that some countries have signed, and if you haven't signed it, you don't have to, you don't have to um, abide by it. And there are things like if an astronaut lands in your country, the treaty signs that they that that country will take care of them if they accidentally land in your country, and, and different things that you won't use space for military means. Some countries haven't signed that, so basically, it, you know, what does that mean? So it's it's a it's a hairy area, and this is why I really think it's important for the general public to know more about it. Because in the space bubble, because we love technology and we just want to do it so much, I, I sometimes find that the human uh, conversation and the impact on humanity is lost. And it's not just for an artistic thing, it's actually in order to be able to make wise decisions about us going further as a civilization for the exact reasons that you're concerned about. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very important point. I think we better finish there. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Just, just to let you know, please go on the the website, uh, Astronomy Ireland. What are you? What are you doing this week for space? You're doing something on Sunday, aren't you? I think you're doing stargazing or something. There's something. Check the website. Uh, Astronomy Ireland are doing something, and the Phoenix Park has a load of activities on the Institute of Physics, and then of course there's loads of amazing music. Um, thank you so much for your attention, and please go to Christine or Barbara if you have any questions about the festival. Good night, and thanks very much for your attention. Thank you.